Hey everybody, I'm Ryan Doyle. This is The Vertigree Table, and in this series, I am going to help you prepare to run The Lost Minds of Fandel, or the excellent adventure that comes with the Dungeons & Dragons starter set, perhaps the most popular Dungeons & Dragons adventure of all time at this point. If you are going to be a player in this campaign, do not watch this. There's going to be spoilers, and it's going to be way less fun for you, I promise. Dungeons & Dragons is not the kind of game where a walkthrough is going to improve your experience. Maybe go watch my D&D 101 series and get the rules down, or check out some character creation videos on this channel. Okay, so just us dungeon masters now, right? Or potential dungeon masters, at least. If you are not quite sure what it takes to be a dungeon master, I laid it out in the previous video in the series, or you can just pick up a copy of the starter set. I have a link down below, an affiliate link down below in the description if you're looking to get a copy of that for cheap. And, you know, you can figure things out by doing it. That's how a lot of us got started. It's definitely how I got started. If you want a quick little tour of what's going on inside that box, I also made an unboxing video. I'll put a link up here for that as well. But within this box, we get all the rules we need to run the game. This thing is 32 pages, but you don't need to memorize spells or, like, the costs of things. So there's really 20 pages that you need to wrap your head around in this book. That's it. But the best thing that comes in that box, man, oh, the Lost Minds of Fandelver. The memories. Oh, I love this thing. You don't have to read all of it to get started. You definitely could. And the adventure is only 50 pages. It's not a ton of material by far. And, you know, you will probably feel better prepared if you read this whole thing, or at least skim over it. But I'm going to tell you, you really need to focus in on the first 19 pages of this bad boy to get started. If you get a good grasp on part one, and then the town of Phandalin, the beginning of part two, you're going to be ready for your first couple of sessions. You know, go through that and highlight stuff, underline it, take notes. I like to take notes. But whatever it is, whatever you need to do to make you feel like you have a solid command of the information. The first page or so of this book gives you some solid advice. This little rules to game by box is definitely solid and probably worth revisiting every few sessions, especially at first, but even for veteran DMs. But but one thing I'm going to, you know, voice on the be consistent line is that it is okay to make a call for a single session just to keep things moving and then go look up the rules afterwards and, you know, apply that proper ruling to the next session. If you own it and announce it to everyone, that's fine. That's cool. If your players, you know, aren't mature enough to handle that, okay, different story, you know, pretend to be an infallible god. But otherwise, yeah, don't be afraid to make mistakes and then correct those mistakes and use temporary fixes now and then. We define a few terms and like formatting things and then we're into it with the background. This is information that the Dungeon Master knows. The players are going to learn some of this organically at the table from, you know, playing through the adventure, talking to NPCs mostly. You need this in your mind so that those NPCs can know parts of it, right? They don't all need to know all of it, but these NPCs are delivering this info to your players. And the players may never learn the whole story. That's okay. That's part of it. You knowing it is going to make it easier to run the game at the table. And this, this is a classic D&D setup and a great lesson to internalize if you were thinking of making your own adventures, homebrewing your own stuff eventually. Lost, ancient secrets buried under a layer or multiple layers of history. You know, this place was built for this purpose, but then something happened and now these things have taken over. Some players will want to learn the whole story, some will not care and just hack and slash their way to the buried treasure. And it is all good. The main points you want to put in front of your players early and often is the Forge of Spells in Wave Echo Cave. Hit that again and again. The Forge of Spells in Wave Echo Cave, because that's it. That is El Dorado. That's Shangri-La. Some of the NPCs think it's a myth. Some people know it exists, and some people are out there hunting for it. Gundren, Rockseeker, and his brothers have found it. They're keeping it secret, but the evil black spider has found out and is trying to take it for himself. Now, the players don't know this when Gundren hires them, but we're going to reveal a lot of that to them pretty quickly, one way or another. At the start, 
all they know is that Gundren hired them to bring a wagon full of stuff, mining material mostly, from the city of Neverwinter to that small frontier town of Phantolin. That's the adventure hook, the thing that gives the player characters motivation. I am going to help you sink that hook way deeper in a minute and to get a few more hooks into the players as well in the process. We get an overview of like the major beats of the adventure. Again, at 50 pages, it may be worth reading through or at least skimming through this whole thing, but I'm going to warn you not to get too far ahead of yourself. Do not fall in love with the cool environments and monsters at the end to the point that the introductory stuff starts to feel boring from you. You could potentially be finishing this whole adventure in like, six or seven sessions, but every table is different. And mine spent months playing through this thing, probably clocking in closer to, I don't even know, 20 sessions all told. Things are going to go faster if your average session is four hours and you jump right in than if you are like we were and could only carve out like two, two and a half hours from everybody's busy lives. Plus, you know, we would do some catching up first, order delivery, pizza, whatever. Yes, think about pacing as far as getting everybody involved and having a good time, but don't worry about progress. It's game night, relax, have fun, and just let it flow. Enjoy it, enjoy the fact that you only need to be a couple steps ahead of the player, so you don't need the entirety of the thing in your mind when you sit down that first time. And I promise, things you're gonna pick up is everybody learns the basics of gameplay and honestly becomes more invested in this story. Next up, we're told that all of this is happening on the Sword Coast of the Forgotten Realms. Now there is a ton of lore about the Forgotten Realms that you are free to look up or leave alone. And I suggest that you leave it alone as a new dungeon master and just know that you can always mine it for inspiration if you want to later. With this and with all of this stuff, feel free to make up or change anything. This is your version of this world. But, you know, if the players decide they want to know what's going on in the Mirror of Dead Men and the book doesn't have anything to say about it, just know a little bit of googling will get you a lot of information. Part 3 actually has a lot of room to improvise if you want to try your hand at making your own material and a little bit of that inspiration can go a very long way in my experience. But before we get into all of that, I want you to know parts 1 and 2 backwards and forwards before you sit down to run this thing. We're actually going to start by studying up on part two and writing down every important NPC, non-player character on page 15. We're adding whatever relevant information the adventure gives us and we're gonna leave some room there to, you know, annotate, make notes later on. I also want you to add Gundren Rockseeker and make a note of his brother's names as well, Nundro and Tharden. We're also going to put Rydoth the Druid on there. For good measure, let's also do Iorno Glassstaff uh, Albrick and Nesnar the Black Spider. Knowing your NPCs is a huge part of preparation, I promise, and having an easy reference all in one place is going to be very helpful at the table. Have it in your notes, or better yet, maybe even attach it to your DM's screen. Now, I find the act of actually physically writing this stuff down helps me remember even before I go to refer to the notes. This prep is also a great time, a great opportunity to make some changes and decisions about these people as well. Do you think this name is impronounceable or just stupid? Change it. It's your world. Do you think it would be better if this person was a different gender or a different race? Cool. Go for it. You want this one to talk like some famous actor or your mutual friend or have some like particular quirk or like mannerism that will help you embody them at the table in the game? Perfect. Each one of these NPCs has a quest for the party, except for the innkeeper who is mostly there to, you know, point our heroes to all of the other people on the map. We're going to make an extra special note on the four NPCs here that are members of factions, and for good measure, we're also going to mark right off the Druid as a member of the Emerald Enclave. Factions are an often underutilized tool that can be super useful in getting information and quests and aid and even different kinds of rewards to the player characters. They build a richer world and can keep things moving forward when you get stuck. These are the main NPCs that we can have like swoop in and make story and adventure happen. So let's be prepared to use them. Each 
faction is associated with a few classes. So try to link each PC to a different faction if you can, if it makes sense. Some players might not bite here, but it can come in handy later if you've got a couple of these connections formed. Again, it might go nowhere, but you're gonna be super happy if this pays off when you need it to. Now, you might be wondering why we skipped ahead and put so much focus on prepping the town when the party is supposed to get through part one first before they even make it to Phandalin. Well, first off, they might end up in town way faster than we expect because this is D&D, so best be ready. But the main reason is this. One of the Dungeon Master's many jobs is getting the players to actually care about the story and these people. It is easy to get them to care about the goblin who's trying to kill them in the heat of combat, but eventually down the road, there may come a moment where the players, the physical human beings at the table, are going to stop and wonder and maybe even say out loud in character or out, why, why are we doing this? Why are we risking our lives to fight these goblins? What are we even doing in these caves again? Especially, especially, especially if it's been weeks of real time since they set out to do the thing. And the answer, centuries ago, gnomes and dwarves and human mages made a pact and dug a mine, uncovering the magical MacGuffin maker. But then the orcs came. Won't be enough for all of your players all of the time. Yes, it is a game and the players need to bring their own buy-in for sure. But the more ties we can give them to this world, the more connected they are going to feel. Plus, the more threads they are going to have to pull on in the game to help them figure things out. And the more strings we, the Dungeon Masters, are going to have to pull to be able to get the PCs moving. So we are going to connect the player characters to this story as much as we possibly can. And we are going to use these non-player characters to do just that. And we are going to do a lot of that work before the game even gets started during character creation. Now the NPCs, the party you're meeting in part two, are pointing the way to what happens in part three and beyond. So at least skim that section, part three, because this is where you as a dungeon master are also going to be making the biggest decisions in this adventure. You might make no decision, but that's still a decision. The party's probably not gonna be visiting all of these places on page 28 to 35. So we can emphasize or even cut some of them. This is also where I would insert my own small side quest or mini dungeon, whatever, if I wanted to do a little homebrewing. Tie your players' backstories to the locations and the NPCs associated with the quests you want to run and edit out the hooks to the plots you don't want to run if you're going to edit here. When I ran Lost Minds of Phandelver, the first time out, I cut Thunder Tree. And honestly, I think that's a good move for a new Dungeon Master, so consider cutting Thunder Tree. We will talk about that when we get there, but keep that in mind. You are free to change, remove, add, anything you want to this story, to this adventure, because you are the Dungeon Master. So we've got the Dungeon Master, that's you, and then we have players. And now in a perfect world, we're going to want between three and five players. The first time I ran this, we had seven, sometimes even eight people around the Verdigree table. I actually had to get another table to add onto it at a certain point. And man, it was a lot of fun. But honestly, it's a bit much for a new dungeon master to manage for a bunch of reasons we're not going to get into. But you know, three to five, if you only have one or two, we can still make that work by using sidekick rules. I'm going to share a link down below to that as well. That's actually coming from the essentials kit, which uh, has those like the last couple pages of the rules in there are for sidekicks. And this is honestly an alternative starting point. I definitely prefer the starter set adventure better, but what I really like and what I think I'm going to talk about at the end of this series is combining the two of these things into one big mega open world sandbox adventure. I think that's the start of my next campaign, but let's not get too far ahead of ourselves, excited as they may be to share that with you your first time out. Let's, let's keep things simple. So you've got your players three to five, ideally, and those players are going to need character sheets. And the starter set actually comes with some pre-generated character sheets. And those are a really nice option because it makes things simple and easy on everybody. And those characters already have ties to this world, to the story of this adventure. Again, you may want to edit those ties. There's one about Thunder Tree. If you're cutting Thunder Tree, obviously change that up. 
but there's also pre-generated characters out there on the internet for free. I'm going to put a link in the description down below if you want to give your players more options for pre-gen. But if you have players that are a little more hands-on, maybe they have some experience with RPGs, be it tabletop or, you know, video games, whatever, they actually may want to create their own characters. And this, honestly, is a great option as well because it gets the players way more invested in their characters instead of saying hey you're this guy they get to build it and also that process will teach them a lot about what they're going to need to know to play Dungeons and Dragons that's kind of the best part and the worst part of bringing new players through character creation you have to know a bunch of game mechanics really to fill out a character sheet and feel like you know what's going on. Hey, guess who made a bunch of videos that can help with that whole process? And guess where I'm gonna put links to that stuff if you want to check it out. Now as the dungeon master, you should really check over the character sheets just to make sure that things are correct to the best of your abilities. I know you might also be new at this, but the players are as likely to cheat themselves out of stuff than they are to cheat themselves into extra stuff on purpose or not. We are also going to put together another handy tool as we do this for our, you know, prep notebook or for our DMs screen, that's where I would put it. We're going to write down all of the player character names along with their passive perception, passive insight. I would also like to put armor class on there and HP. You know, AC changes less frequently than HP. I'm going to put them both on my DM screen. Now, if I were starting for a brand new group of players, I think I would have a session zero. You can dive right into the action and that's fun, there's arguments for that, but a session zero is a great way to make sure that everybody's on the same page and coming in with similar expectations. If I am, you know, preparing to run a game in tone like Lord of the Rings and you want Mighty Python, right? And she wants Game of Thrones and he wants to play Harry Potter. We're going to have a little conflict here unless we reach some sort of compromise. Someone's going to be uh, bent out of shape at least a little bit. And it's also good to establish some boundaries. You know, someone at the table might not want super intense blood and gore descriptions or, you know, maybe they don't want to fight snakes or spiders because they have some phobia. Some people, you know, are never going to blink at anything, while other people are really not going to enjoy <laughs> dealing with certain kinds of themes. Don't assume that you know who is who at your table. Someone might have some trauma in their past that you have no idea about that they don't really want coming up during game night. Or, you know, maybe someone doesn't want to deal with the spell plague in the age of COVID because it doesn't sound like a fun way to spend the couple hours they have of free time when they're trying to escape. There's a ton of variation and reasons to this. Be respectful and be kind. And as the dungeon master, it's also kind of on you to make sure the other people at the table are acting accordingly. Besides the serious side of gaming, Session Zero can also be a real blast because it's fun to make characters together. Even if we're just grabbing those pre-made characters from the box or from the you know website, it, it gives players the opportunity to figure out how they know each other. If you can bake in that party cohesion early on, that is great. We want a team that works together, that cares about each other as quickly as we can possibly get there. That, you know, standoffish, edgy, distrustful character rarely plays out as fun as it may sound in your head. Even if it's just like a single connection to another player character, that's a healthy start. This is also your chance as the DM to work with your players to get their characters' backstories to hook up, to connect with the adventure. Again, if you can give each player character a relationship with a non-player character waiting for them in Phandalin, even if it's just like some letter of introduction or a rumor circulating that points the way to them, that's great. But the main NPC, the main thing we want to put our focus on, at least at first, is making the player characters and the players, the actual human beings sitting around that table with you. We want everybody to care about Gundren Rockseeker. We also want them to like, care about Sildar, but we want to do everything we can think of to get these people to love Gundren. This adventure kind of just assumes that the player characters are going to spend a lot of time and effort and put themselves in danger in order to rescue Gundren Rockseeker. But as it's written, the players don't even meet the guy. You can jump right in where the book tells you to and ask the players as suggested, hey, how does your character know Gundren? But 
I have a different recommendation. We start in the tavern, as is tradition. All good D&D campaigns should start in a tavern. Fight me about it in the comments. You know, in Neverwinter, the night before we hit the road, whether this is the start of our first session, or, you know, this is the end of session zero, we put the characters around a table, give them a chance to introduce themselves and, you know, interact a little bit. And listen, it is okay if the players are just kind of describing what their characters do. That is still role-playing, I promise. We don't need to act like professional actors. We don't need to do the voice to play D&D. That stuff is certainly fun, but you can simply describe how your character acts and speaks. The same goes for you as the DM. If you want the players going all out, you know, lead by example. But that goes for us as the DM because we're putting Gundren and Sildar at that table as well. And we're gonna do everything we can to make them like Gundren and Sildar. I play Gundren as something like Yukon Cornelius from that old claymation Christmas Rudolph movie, if you know. He's excited, he's eccentric, he's, you know, quick to laugh, and he's like super animated. He's also paying for everybody's meal, and the drinks are flowing, and he's he's got your night covered at the inn. Maybe he even paid for the PC's gear, right, that we just set him up with. He's a miner who found that secret mother load, and he's practically bursting at the seams to get back there. That is why he and Sildar are going to go ahead, while our party is going to go get that wagon filled with equipment, and follow up, you know, half a day after. This little tavern scene helps us set the table. Gundren wants to get back to town to get rich, though he's, you know, keeping those details a little hush-hush. Sildar wants to go check in on his old wizard buddy, Iarno Albrecht, who's disappeared. The player characters now have all their own reasons to get to Fandolin and hook up with these NPCs or whatever else you cooked up. And also Gundren is paying them to go there and will probably have more work for them as well later and everybody loves gold it's a great incentivizer on top of everything else plus the players themselves have a bunch of cool abilities on this piece of paper in front of them and they can't wait to use them and this moment right here is a great place to fade to black as everybody calls it a night and heads up to their respective rooms and you narrate out the next day sildar and gundren set out on horseback the party gets the wagon together and they're about half a day behind they take the high road south for a couple days, camping out at night beneath the stars, and then eventually they turn onto the Tribor Trail. The high road is civilized. It goes between metropolises. It's well patrolled. But the Tribor Trail, different story. It's a little more dangerous. And now the party is on their guard for bandits or worse. And about half a day down that trail, they come around the bend and they see two dead horses splayed out in the middle of the path. If we did a session zero and a character creation, this might be the very moment where we leave things off for the night. It is a good kind of mysterious cliffhanger and the players are gonna be excited for next session. To further amp up that excitement, I personally would consider sharing the map. The one on page five is for the dungeon master's eyes only because all of the locations are keyed. It has spoilers, but a player's version of this map is very easy to find online. There's also a nice version of it inside the Essentials Kit if you're considering the combo. I personally have always been a sucker for a story that starts with a map, so I think it will get at least some of your players even more excited to start diving in and exploring this world. If at this point we have around an hour of game time left, then when they find these horses, I would run the Goblin Ambush, get some action and give the players a little taste of combat, get those dice rolling, and let them see what their characters can do. If we have more time, then we can push further and maybe even finish part one. You know, I don't know how much time you'll have left, but don't get locked into one option. Let the game flow. And as the end approaches, start looking for good opportunities to finish. That'll keep the players excited for next time. If you can stop your session right before combat breaks out, that's usually great. So you can start that next session with the bang. In the next video, we are diving into that part one where the goblin arrows fly. It is a ton of fun, but can also be very dangerous for our baby level one player characters here. So don't worry, I'm going to help you run this ambush and the fantastic Kragmaw hideout in a way that's going to keep driving the story forward instead of ending things before we barely begun. I will see you there next time. Thank you so much for watching. Get out there, be kind, have fun, and thanks again. Bye.